Excellent. Good. Mike, thank you very much for joining us. And um, uh, you can, I think you'll be able to see um, our, our attendees uh, in, in the attendee list. So what I'd like to do, I'm Judy Sandrock from X in a Box, and I'd like to welcome everybody to our workshop. This is our third workshop. And this evening we're going to be covering what, it, what is it that we need to um, take into consideration when designing our CubeSat payload. So we have a, a, a guest with us this evening, a special guest, Mike Miller. And uh, Mike, we, we met uh, a few years ago and uh, at a CubeSat developers workshop. And uh, we've been in contact uh, ever since then. And Mike, uh, you've done the most incredible work with, uh, with students, schools, teachers, universities, um, helping them uh, get their payloads into space, um, getting, you know, getting through all the, all the red tape, jumping over all of those hurdles, um, and to, to be able to, to fly their satellites and their payloads. So um, uh, what I'd like to do is um, I'd, I'd like to first, if you don't mind, I'd like to share with everybody the questions that, um, that I'd pose to you just to get everything rolling. Um, uh, Mike, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, we're going to have a, you know, a, 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 a talk from you, if that's okay, and then if we can open it up to questions um, until uh, 30 minutes past the hour, until half past. Um, if that's okay, and then what we're going to do is that we're going to go into um, a session that Bianca started delivering to us on Thursday last week, um, all about communications, all about radios and how to, uh, how to do all the calculations, where to find all those calculation tools, etc. So we would really like it if you could stay with us then for the balance of, of our, our workshop, um, if that's okay. So, um, Mike, before I, before I hand over to you, um, what I'd like to do is that I'd quickly like to share, um, uh, what I'd like to do is that I'd like to be able to share this presentation. Um, there we go. Um, Okay, you know, isn't it absolutely amazing? It now said that it failed to share. Uh, so let me just try again. Uh, what did they say? Um, uh, when in doubt, try and try again. There we go, click share. Okay, let's share that. Great. Can everybody see that? <laughs> How is that? Okay, perfect. So yeah, our, our guest speaker, uh, Mike Miller from, uh, from Stirk. And the first question is, what is the most common challenge for schools when seeking FCC approval for their CubeSats? The second question, which three tips can you give to schools so that they can have a successful mission with minimal hassle? And the third question, are there opportunities for schools to work together on common missions, constellations, and launches so that they may share efforts and expenses? So at this point, Mike, I'm going to hand over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I assume my audio is satisfactory for everyone. Okay, great. Um, Okay, well, Judy has posed some of the uh, seminal questions here about uh, doing satellite missions and uh, certainly about the regulatory aspects of those, which are what concern me the most day to day. Um, so let's get right to it. I'm speaking from the experience of about 15 years of regulatory work in the small satellite area. And uh, I've probably worked on more than 100 small satellites and getting them into orbit and contributing in various ways. Uh, the most common challenge that I've seen working either with K-12 education or with university education 
I guess the overarching challenge is uh, uh, for for the education act project is an understanding of the regulatory practices and the space engineering analytics. Uh, these are different disciplines and different cultures between education and between space engineering and regulatory. And uh, they all have a contribution to make for your project. And you, I would say your typical educator, uh, as, as I encounter you, uh, you had too much to do before you took this project on. And now you have way too much to do. And at the same time, to be challenged to develop the technical analyses and the documents and submit the applications and respond to questions. Uh, this is a different skill set than what you're supposed to be doing when you educate people. Uh, and it's a different culture as well. So it should not be expected to be simple. Uh, for the university, the challenge is often, uh, in practical terms, freezing your design in time to get it licensed. Uh, we, there's a, a tendency to want to continue to improve, which is a good tendency. But uh, there's also the requirement that if you want to launch it on time, you have to freeze the design at some point. And we have to have pretty much a frozen design before we can begin to license it. So that's a consideration. At the K-12 level, uh, I frequently see that a more requ frequent requirement is understanding what information is needed and organizing to obtain it in a timely fashion because it's one of those kind of things where we can't uh, work one hour a day on it for nine months or nine hours a day on it for one month and have the same result. Uh, you have to start early and you have to stay on schedule. So, Judy, would you like us to discuss in some more detail the answer to question one before we move on to two, or would you like me to cover all three questions and then have discussion as an aggregate? Can you uh, yeah, Mark, there? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think it would be great if you can go through, because we can always come back. Um, what I did is that I made a, I made a note in the chat channel about, as you say, we have to, at some point, we have to freeze the design, um, because I totally agree with you. Um, I've, I've visited universities where they're years into it, and they, they just keep changing the design and adding to it and adding to it, and it gets heavier and bigger and more and more and more expensive. And honestly, um, eventually it starts getting out of date <laughs> because technology moves on, you know. So, um, and there's no learning, really. Uh, because, you know, we only learn really by doing. So, so yeah, if you wouldn't mind, we can always come back. And I really encourage everybody who's in the session this evening, uh, today, please, to, to post uh, questions for Mike. Super. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try to share my screen now and show... and show a, a, a summary of what I've just been saying. So hopefully you're now seeing question one and a summary of the answer that I just gave you. Uh, let's go on to question two. Which three tips can I give to schools so that they have a successful mission with minimal hassle? Okay, this is a subject I love. Uh, but uh, I love and hate both, I suppose. But all right, the first, the thing that you will always hear from me or anybody, I suppose, is start early on the regulatory. In fact, start early on everything because you will, uh, you will need to have a schedule and you'll need to keep to it to be successful. Uh, it's just, again, you can't, it's very difficult to make for, up for lost time because there are some things that just take so much time to bake. And uh, I guess whatever metaphors you want to use, whether it's, uh, whether it's baking or something else, there's no substitute for having enough time. 
the other is try to get help rather than learn everything. Don't try to be an expert on everything. Uh, you're already experts on education and nobody else is going to be the education expert but you. So you have to do that job and you have to organize things so that others do other jobs. Uh, that's how space works. You have, uh, you always have a team of people with dis different disciplines. Uh, this is one of the most valuable lessons the students take away from the experience is that you, you work as a team to succeed. The first student team that I ever worked with certainly learned that lesson and they articulated it themselves uh, when we took them to the small set conference. This was the all middle school uh, the five through eight upper room of a two room school. And their presentation was along the lines of every time we try to build something all by ourselves, we failed. And every time we worked together, we succeeded. And I really haven't had any better lesson to bring you in all the years that I've uh, experienced since. So teach, teach, by experience that they should trust each other, they should be worthy of trust, and they should support each other. That's, uh, that's maybe more some philosophy than rocket science, but that's how you get things built, and that's how you make them work. So you, and you need to apply the team concept throughout. Your team needs to consist not only of the people at your school, the people in your organization, but you, you, need to, you need to incorporate the knowledge and understanding of others. Uh, design review is baked into the process for big space programs, and it needs to be part of your process as well. Get outside reviewers, people who've built satellites before, to look at your design from first concept and and provide their insights and keep you from going down a lot of wrong paths. Uh, you don't have time to make all the mistakes anybody ever made over again. You need to have time to make your own mistakes. So benefit from the experience of others and get external review. And this, this, uh, this is necessary because space is hard, which is a saying that you'll hear from people who been doing space for a while. And space is hard and the team has to make it work. Uh, I've occasionally heard people say, learn from failure. But you want, yes, okay, but you want all those failures to occur in the lab and none of them to occur in space. Uh, failures that occur in space tend to, uh, tend to terminate opportunity for all the aspects of the mission. Uh, the example I use, if your communications doesn't work in space, you won't get to know how good your spacecraft bus works. The experiment people will never know how well their experiment worked. So, uh, so get it right on the ground. Allow yourself time to test and correct. And Judy's third question, are there opportunities for schools to work together on common missions, constellations and launches so that we share efforts and expenses? And I'd say, yeah, that's, that's a really good idea. Just as I'm an advocate of sharing knowledge, I also, uh, I also believe there's a lot to be gained from sharing resources and collaborating on projects. And um, a specific would be sharing ground station resources. A ground station dedicated to one satellite is going to be idle for 99% of the time. And that, that doesn't need to be the case. You can possibly find other people's ground stations that you can use. Or if you want to build a ground station, you can build it to support a number of satellites and collaborate on that. There's also ways to build satellites that don't need ground stations using constellations like Global Star or Iridium to facilitate your communications. So you have some options there in the space to uh, mission operations link. And uh, 
in these times, uh, the way we're meeting today remotely using Zoom sessions, uh, that's, we've all had to adjust to that, but it also creates opportunity. The reviews that I mentioned earlier can be conducted much more effectively and you can get much higher caliber reviewers at, with much less effort on their part if you're conducting remote review sessions. So just as you can incorporate resources for review, you can collaborate resources to work together. There isn't so much difference between different members of a team at one school working together and extending that team to several schools. Uh, if you're working virtually, if you're working remotely, then you have the chance to, to put people together who have common interests regardless of their location or their affiliation. So you have a great opportunity, I'd say an unprecedented opportunity these days to build teams across organizations. And I'd encourage you to, to talk to one another and look for common ground there. You, you could be building the same satellite and possibly organize different teams for different systems, which you will do whether you are one organization, one school or several. Uh, you can also work together by, uh, by one, one school builds the satellite, the other one builds the ground station, or uh, you can build, you can each build your own satellite, but share common design elements. Uh, different schools could contribute different, different subsystems, and those subsystems could be replicated across different schools and different satellites where, uh, where you, you have the resources to put together your own satellite, but you might find it interesting to spread the work out with respect to system design. Okay, that's it. Fairly short, hopefully fairly sweet. I would like to take questions now, if that's appropriate. Absolutely. Um, Mike, if it's okay, if you want to uh, stop sc uh, sharing your screen, because then I think you'll be able to uh, see the questions. Um, I'm very happy, actually, that uh, we do have, we, at the moment, we have two questions. So I was wondering, um, from, from Shivam, who is actually in the United Arab Emirates, um, who's joined us from there, um, he asked, the, the question is, would using a hyperspectral be good to use uh, on a 1U CubeSat? Hmm. Okay, thank you, Shiva. Interesting question. A hyperspectral imager on a 1U CubeSat, um, it may have been done. I'd have to, I'd have to look around, but obviously it depends on the, uh, the volume and power requirements of your hyperspectral imager. Uh, the, the platform has to be big enough to support the instrument, no matter what your experiment is, of course. Uh, hyperspectral imaging uh, may imply a certain level of attitude control, of pointing of your hyperspectral imager. So you have to be sure that you have that pointing capability, but I see no reason that could not be done in a 1U form factor. Uh, it just, as I say, you need to look at, you need to build your satellite around your instrument, basically, identifying the pointing requirements and the power requirements, the data requirements, uh, the volume and, and things like that. And that will tell you how big your spacecraft bus has to be. Great. Mike, thank you very much. And Frederick, um, Frederick Rob is asking, please discuss why some satellites use of amateur bands are declined coordination from the IARU. What are the requirements for the use of amateur bands? Okay, great. Sorry, could you say again the, the, who's asked the question? It's a very good question. It's Frederick Rob. In fact, what I can do is, Frederick, if you want to, please unmute yourself and, um, and ask the question directly, because you never know, I may be messing it up. Sure. 
sure. I, I'm going to guess that Frederick may be from the United States. We yes, Frederick correct. is from the United States, yes. Thank Frederick you. is, yes. Okay. Certainly. No, the, the question's a very appropriate question and very clear. Uh, and, and it's a question that <laughs> actually I ask a lot too. Uh, why, why are some declined? Basically, the, um, one, of the, one of the things that we deal with is that in the United States, we have a particular system for licensing that may be a little different from what's done in other countries. The IARU is, of course, an international or world body, and they need to implement the same set of rules across the board around the world. And that can be challenging sometimes when the regulatory environments are different from one country to another. Uh, the, the, the requirements for Part 97, uh, the amateur operation, uh, are basically to, there needs to be an actual amateur component. You not only need to be wanting to use the amateur frequency, but you need to be contributing to the amateur arts and uh, operating in a way that's consistent with amateur rules. And I would say that where IARU declines to coordinate, that is often because they feel that one of those criteria have not been met. And there, there is debate. There is certainly debate sometimes about how the rules are applied. Um, I don't I don't have a pat answer for you on how to get your application approved the first time by IARU. I wish I did. I would, uh, I would get a lot more done in some cases if I, if I knew that. I would say work carefully with AMSAT. There are people at AMSAT, the U.S. Amateur Satellite Organization, who also sit on the board of the IARU. And I look to AMSAT often to help me understand if a mission is consistent with the, the AMSAT and the IARU interpretation of the rules for Part 97. I hope that answer is helpful. Great. Mike, thank you very much. And we actually do have uh, William Edmondson um, in the group. And um, William, I was just wondering if you would like to unmute yourself and uh, assist with that, with, with an answer to the question. Hi, <clears throat> thanks, Judy. This is uh, a response to the question uh, about the hyperspectral imager on the one you. Okay. And I would just like to uh, add to, um, uh, Mike's response, because I've done a little work in looking at hyperspectral and multispectral imager, and usually due to the resolution one is looking at, it's almost, uh, from a physics standpoint, impossible to put the imager in a 1U. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that the communications for a hyperspectral imager, the data download that needs to uh, occur because of the amount of information being collected, you can't do this in an amateur radio. Uh, you will require like an S band, X band uh, type communications protocol. Which, in excess, which means that you need increased power, uh, antenna size, and as Mike said, pointing accuracy, et cetera, et cetera. So to attempt to do this in a one U, I don't want to use the word impossible because as technology, as technology uh, grows, or as technology, uh, you know, uh, becomes smaller and smaller, it might happen. But again, as Mike said, it's based upon what resolutions, what your orbit is, the resol you know, both, and what spectral bands you need. So I just wanted to add 
to that. Great. William, thank you very much. So, yeah, so maybe um, not for this CTE, for the CTE CubeSat mission, one new CubeSat mission, maybe for another mission. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah, Mike, we have another question here, um, and that's from, from Warren. Um, Warren is based in Maine uh, on the east coast of the USA, and his question is, what is the reasonable maximum data bandwidth that can be realized in a CubeSat without going to microwave bands. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you, Warren. That's, <laughs> that's the sort of thing that requires typically multiple trips to the whiteboard to figure out. But uh, just some general observations and guesses about where you're coming from. I'm thinking you're, you're, you're thinking of UHF band uh, and and that you're you're asking you're saying what if I want to use UHF band and don't want to use S band then how much data rate could I get uh, and if you you can signal me a thumbs up or some thumbs down yeah. if I'm on the right track yeah there, he's, yeah he says yes. Yes, UHF is great okay great, great okay so we're going to use UHF and we want to know what our data rate can be. And um, I, don't, I don't. I mean, the the answer lies in what is what's the power of your transmitter? What's the gain of your antenna? What is your ability to point the antenna at the receiving station on the ground? And what is the sensitivity, uh, or the gain of the gain of the antenna on the ground, and the sensitivity of the receiver? And if that sounds like a whole bunch of waffling on my part, well, that's just how it is because it's a calculation. It isn't an opinion. Uh, so what I would say to do is get out something like the link budget, uh, a link budget uh, spreadsheet, the one that's posted on for, for UHF, especially the one that's posted on the IARU website made by Jan King, who generously shares it with everybody, is an excellent uh, example of a link budget spreadsheet to use. And if you sit down at that and you start plugging in those parameters that I just named, uh, then you will pretty soon understand what the limits uh, of the data rate are. Uh, remember to allow some link margin to uh, essentially make your link stronger than it needs to be for the data rate that you're thinking about because things always go wrong. Things are always non-optimal. They don't point exactly where you want or there's lots of clouds in the way or other things. So allow some link margin and there are guidelines in that spreadsheet that will tell you about allowing that margin. And then you will come up with you know, a, a data rate, and the data rate might be anywhere from 19.2 uh, kilowatt to uh, to something maybe maybe twice that, but maybe it'll be half that, depending on on the uh, constraints of your space station and your ground station. But it won't be uh, it won't be 10 times 19.2 probably, I, I don't think, unless you have a really good radio. So that's enough waffling about that. That's the method by which you can determine what the bandwidth is. And uh, I'd say good, good luck with that. That's something you have to go through anyway for your mission. Uh, you have to have a link budget if, it's, if you're working amateur band, which is fraught with its own challenges as pointed out by the previous question but uh, you will have to provide a link budget like that along with your coordination application if you seek coordination from the IARU and you'll also want to do a link budget just because it's the core engineering of your communication system you really can't have a communications plan without a link budget Great, Mike. Thank you very much. Um, and bef before we um, before we close off this this part of our of our workshop, um, Frederick has also just uh, posted a, a, a request um, 
could you please discuss the entire process and costs? So before you start, um, you know, I think that to, to discuss the, the entire process and, and the costs associated with it, perhaps what we should do is maybe we should actually plan another session with you um, so, that one, so that we can prepare for that. And uh, I think that would be a really, I think that could be very, very valuable for everybody to actually understand the process that they're going to need to go through and also the costs associated with that so that everybody can actually start budgeting. Um, I know a lot of the schools are, they're, they're doing fundraising to, to support their, their missions. So yeah, we, we need to know how, how much we, we need to raise um, in order to be able to pay for that. So um, if that's okay, um, Mike, if, if you and I can um, have, have a discussion um, in the next uh, number of days uh, about maybe planning another workshop where we can go through that. Um, Frederick, uh, I, I think that's a great suggestion. And uh, thank you very much. I also need to find out from Mike, are we getting too much free consulting from him? So uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let, let's, let's not push our luck too much. Um, Mike, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, we've had some really great questions and, and very apt as well, because that's our topic at the moment is all about communications. Um, as you say, if your communications don't work, um, then it doesn't matter what is working on your satellite or not, because uh, it's, it's all mute. Uh, excuse the pun. So, um, yeah, Mike, thank you very much. Um, really, we would like you to stay uh, for, for the balance of, of Bianca's session uh, on, on communications. And also what you can do is you can, um, you can fact check him for us. How's that? Um, and, and actually see uh, if, if, we, if we're on the right track. So, yeah, uh, thank you once again. And uh, Bianca, um, can I hand over to you, please? You, you can indeed. Um, yeah, so I know that both Mike uh, and, and, of course, uh, William um, probably have to um, uh, fact check what I'm saying here, since I am the newbie in, in the space industry here. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to continue my uh, presentation I started uh, last time. And um, that you should be able to see on your screen now. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go like a couple of minutes back here, just so we can get back to the thing here with the link budget. So remember when we had this link budget here, we had like a couple of different um, information from our data sheets on the radios and we had some information from the antennas and we have to calculate uh, a couple of other um, uh, um, uh, variables here. So the radio, remember that was transmitting with, uh, with 20 dB and our radio was receiving with 148. And remember we say minus because when we normally talk about radio, we're talking about a loss. But the radios are now actually have a good gain here. That's actually where most of the benefit in the in the link budget comes from is from those 148 dB. So in the formula, it will say minus the loss, and therefore we say minus minus 148. So that becomes uh, the positive uh, green here. And then we had the the antennas that both had 2 dB. And then remember we said the cable or the connection or whatever. We just set to 5 dB. I put it in a bracket here because that's kind of like uh, the normal one for, you know, on your satellite. It's a very short uh, um, uh, cable if, if you even have a cable there. And of course, in your, uh, if you have a ground station where you have an antenna on the roof, then this might be a completely uh, different number. And then we have to, of course, calculate our um, uh, uh, loss for the distance here. So we have these, um, and I, I went through them uh, last time, these four different links here. So I'm just going to go through them again, just to kind of like get, um, get the refreshing here. So we had the link budget. And uh, in the link budget here, um, and as, as it is, um, 
for me, when it comes to these things here, I, I haven't, I, I'm a software guy. I haven't, I'm not an IF guy or anything like that. So I'm trying to figure out how to do this thing here using lo a lot of these online calculators that exist out there. And the nice thing is that the formula is actually here. So if you want to kind of like go through the formula, you can see here it says minus because it's a loss here on the receiver. And therefore we put minus in when we put in the formula and I in, uh, put in the formula here. But we start with transmitting with 20 dB. And remember, we could also measure it in watts. And then of course, it's gonna be 100 milliwatts, but because it's, uh, it makes it a little bit easier with the arithmetic here, we are gonna use uh, 20 dB. Then we have the transmitter antenna gave us two dB in gain. And then we have a loss of 5 dB for the cable. And then we have to calculate the free loss, but let's first put in the losses we have on the antenna cable on the other side, plus the antenna. We have a gain of two, and then we receive with a loss of minus 148. And then we have to calculate the, the free space loss. And I clicked here, and then it comes up, and now it's actually a matter of the frequency. So if I say, for example, I wanna communicate, uh, I'm standing right underneath the International Space Station and I wanna communicate to the International Space Station and we're gonna use a 915 megahertz. That is the ISM ratio that you get in your kit. And of course, that's not the antenna, like the frequency you're gonna use in space because that's only uh, one that's allowed when you're on the ground in or, you know, on a balloon or whatever, but um, in the US or the America. So remember from last time, the Americas have, you know, their ITU region two, and they have an ISM frequency of license free frequency of 915 megahertz, while in the Europe and ITU region one is 868 and also 433. I'm coming back to the 433. When we have the antenna gains and we can calculate and we get this 139 dB. So the whole idea is that, um, I just have to move this out of the way, thank you. Uh, so we put in, uh, and I forgot it, 139.7, 139.7, and we calculate, and we have um, a little bit power left here to actually get in all the 400. Um, uh, kilometers. Now, if you really want to um, transmit in space, then you should use another frequency than this one here. And in the amateur band, you will normally use the seven centimeter uh, downlink band, and we have a radio called IL1 for that, 420, let's say 434 megahertz. And you can say it says 139. Now, if I calculate that, I actually get. Um, um, 133 in my in loss now. So it's a less of a loss because my frequency, the lower it is, the, the longer uh, range it has. So it now 133 instead of 137. So 133.2, I go back here and I say 133.2 and calculate. And of course, this is straightforward. So the five I had more automatic gets there. Also remember that 400 kilometers is if you're right underneath the ISS. Um, I'm gonna show you um, in a calculation where it shows that we are actually not right underneath many times. We can be up to, let's say 2,300 kilometers away. And if I calculate that, my number is now 148.4. I'll put that in and we're gonna see here if I still have uh, so I have to type that, 148.4, and calculate, and we're still just within the margin. So this is, a, this is an example of calculating your um, link budget here. Um, let's go uh, and jump over. So we went through this thing here with calculating the friction zone. And that is, of course, if you are communicating not uh, to a satellite, but you're uh, communicating over the ground. Uh, and then you have to make sure there's no trees, or buses, buildings, any other stuff 
in between. So when you calculate the diameter of this fresnel zone, as you can see here in the image here, then you can use this calculator here. It's all on my slide here on the fresnel zone here. And then there was, of course, also the calculation I went through last time about the horizon. So if you want to really test the distance of 2300 uh, uh, kilometers, uh, then you can see here how high you have to be off in order to just look over the horizon and you still have to add the Fresnel zone to that when you do this calculation here. But what I really wanted to show was this uh, Kelskar here. And uh, there's a link here, the first link is uh, for the International Space Station. Um, and you can actually look up a lot of different satellites here. But um, uh, if I go down to uh, this one here, um, and you can see here that uh, my observation here is, uh, is uh, from South Africa where I am now. And um, um, you can see that the International Space Station flies in, in this orbit here. And um, if I look at uh, my next flyby, normally there's a link uh, here. Let me just see here if I can open it up a bit. No, I'm just getting a... Um, uh, let me just see here. Oh, uh, no. We're getting it now. Okay, anyhow, on this on this screen here, I showed it last time, so now of course I'm um it says no event found here. So um um I know it flies over every uh, uh every now and then. So let's just see if we can get it to, um a bit longer. Uh no. Maybe here. Uh, still nothing. Okay, but on, on this website here, you can, uh, as I showed you last time, um, you can see that sometimes it flies over from another, um, it doesn't fly right over you. And it fly over you in the horizon, then it can be up to, you know, two, three thousand kilometers away when they fly over. So therefore, um, the same with your satellite. If you uh, fly your satellite and every time it comes over you, which is like once every 12 hours, if it's in if it flies in low Earth orbit, then you should uh, make sure that your link budget is not just for 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 right overhead, but actually from an angle, so you've been able to um, downlink every time. Okay, so that was just a little bit of a refresher here. Um, what I want to go on with here is that uh, there's some other usage of of. Uh, of, of LoRa. So I was talking about LoRa and remember I was kind of like also mentioning there was a, a couple of satellites uh, in October that is launching with, with LoRa. And, and we're using LoRa simply because of those radios have this um, very high sensitivity and um, and, and it's, it, it's just very easy for us to, to program to communicate LoRa in both directions. And, um, and because of the of, of, of the modulation and, and, the, and the way it's, it's kind of like jumping between the frequency and doing chirps, we, we kind of like tend to get a, a much better um, throughput. And because there was a question about the throughput before, I actually looked it up for LoRa. Um, uh, so on the LoRa here, you have something called spreading factor. And of course you have the bandwidth of the signal itself. So the bandwidth you can lower can use 125, 250, or 500 kilohertz bandwidth, and then you have a spreading factor. So this is like a, a, in short the duration of each chip uh, that is there. So when you configure your lower radio in your software, you will give it like these kind of configurations here, and you can see then how many bits per second. So 96, which is a very common speed. Uh, I think that was also as a nine uh, nine uh, nine thousand six hundred bits per second or bull was the one that Mike was also referring to. That's a very common speed, but you can see here that you can have all kind of different speeds that's lower and higher. And LoRa was never intended to, and this like a little different depending on what radio you have. 
Lore was never intended to download, um, you know, HD movies or 4K movies or anything like that. Nor was intended to uh, to send data like, for example, your water meter level or, or you know, and reading of 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 a few sensor data. And because X in a box is mainly that kind of data level, Lua is very suitable for us. We don't need, you know, to send anything like faster than nine six uh, nine uh, uh, nine thousand six hundred uh, bits per second. We can send even a lower uh, speed, which give us a much longer range. But there is possibility to change that if you, for example, for some reason want to use uh, the radio on on the X um, X chip to 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 download some other information than um, just uh, um, small chips of data. So um, if you dig further into LoRa, there's uh, like a calculator where you can go in and you can give a number of different parameters and will come out and give you the data range. Anyhow, um, you can use it for a number of different things. So, for example, the lower ratio um, that we provide can also do these other modulation: FSK, DFSK, MSK, DMSK, and then on the FSK you can um, do this OOK uh, modulation on top. And then you have lower range. Now, the reason why these different things are important is, of course, that when we talk lower, we talk lower on a lower level. So we, we talk lower on a level where uh, we can kind of like decide uh, how we communicate because we, we own both radios. We have the radio on the ground station and we have the radio on the satellite. And when you have it like that, you can kind of like say, well, I want to use this protocol. I want to, it's really like I can talk Klingon to my son uh, if he can speak Klingon and, you know, I don't really care that English is the most talked language because it's just between me and my son. But if I have to be on a call, like for example, this one I have now, I better speak, speak English because everybody kind of like expects that that is language spoken. Your yeah, man is, yes. Sorry, there's a, there's a question from Warren here while you're on yes. the topic. He's asking, can a higher power version of LoRa be used on a satellite in space? Um, or do we so, need to enlist somebody else to help with that question? Yeah, so, so the first I just want to say, and, and definitely we can enlist somebody else with that question. So the first I just want to say that, that the lower rate that we have here, can, I think it can transmit with higher power than with 20 dB, probably, you know, 100 milliwatts. I think it can send with 200 milliwatts that the rate that we have. So it can go to 23 dB. But, but as I also showed last time, whether I transmit with with 100 milliwatts or 1.3 milliwatts, the only difference there is that um, that's like uh, what was said we calculated was 10, 11 uh, dB in difference, and and everything is actually on the receiver end because I receive a minus 148 dB. It's it's that's where it's important because we are. We are, in the old days, it was very important to be able to transmit the light very high power because the radios were not very good at, um, at listening. Today, that's completely different. We have radios that have exceptional um, sensitivity and therefore high power to transmit with is many times not um, a waste. And, and, and there's many reasons for that. The first thing is that it costs electricity. If it's like a, the satellite have a limited power budget, and, and if you want to send with a higher uh, the power, then you, of course, have to have that, uh, um, that power uh, system available. That could mean that you have to have more solar panels or bigger batteries and things like that. The other is, of course, also that you disturb it for more people. The lower, um, the lower power you can transmit with, uh, the less you interfere with others who also want to transmit data in, in the free air here. So, you know, if you can listen and therefore select very carefully your frequency and, and, and look through the noise, then that's a better option than, than actually transmit higher power. But do you open the floor to, uh, to either William or Mike if they have uh, anything they want to add to that? Yeah, Mike, uh, you know, are, are there limits to what we're allowed to do? You know, are, are, would we be allowed to send out our satellite up and... Uh, shout back to the planet.
You know, that might be a FCC question. So, so can you, can you frame the question a little bit? What, I mean, you can do a lot of things, but you can't do everything, uh, obviously. Uh, what's, what sort of power would you be considering? Uh, if you can give me an order of magnitude, maybe I can comment on that based on experience. Um, uh, I must say, Warren, he, he, Warren didn't put any uh, any particulars in here. Um, so, yeah, he's he was he was just saying, um, uh, can a higher power version of the of LoRa be used on a satellite in space? Um, I suppose one could use an amplifier with the LoRa. That's that's just that's just all he, all he he hasn't given any specifications. So okay. So maybe maybe we should just take it offline and uh, maybe Bianca, if you should should we continue? Um, yeah, I, I could I mean, give just a very that... I could give a very brief answer on, on that, Judy and Bianca. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you'll you'll find that unless you're doing an amateur coordination, you'll have to do a, uh, an EMC, an electromagnetic coordination analysis, so that whatever your power characteristic is, whatever your power is and whatever your EIRP is, uh, you'll have to make an analysis of whether that would likely interfere with other people. That's the criteria for, that limits the power that you can use. If you turn the power up to where it's likely to interfere with others, then uh, the FCC would have a problem with it. But if you can, if you can show that it would not interfere, and there's methods for showing that, then uh, then you can turn the power up. Yes. Thanks, Mike. Um, I think also just um, I mean there's a number of other limitations one have to also consider, especially as long as you're using on the ground. So with, with LoRa and with, with these different protocols you use on ground, you have something called a duty cycle. And that means that uh, you, when you send data, you're only allowed to occupy the, the frequency for, for, for so many seconds out of a minute or you know, so many percent of, of the time. So, so there's a number of different other rules that, that's important. And LoRa is kind of like built around that you send a little chirp of, of data and therefore you're not really, your duty cycle and your occupancy on, on, on the frequency is not like very high. But, but there's a number of, of different rules and uh, using law in space is quite, quite new. So that's the reason why I take some of these other protocol up here. Um, I want to just continue here with, with LoRa. So there's a build up on top of LoRa that's called LoRa Vane. And the reason for that is that you can there's a number of ground stations. I took like a screenshot here of a map for the SYNC network in, in the US. So you can see these uh, blue bubbles is telling how many uh, transmitters there is within um, uh, the circle here. So th this is by no means a, 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 a national covered uh, solution. This is actually individual people, universities, schools that put up a lower van gateway. So what they do is actually just put a gateway up and it's takes data and it just uh, connects it to the internet like the things network in this case. And that allows you to use lower van and that you can also use our uh, rated to. So, so, so lower van is kind of like a high level. So in, in network, uh, um, when you talk about network, you talk about the seven layer OC um, ISO um, network model. So uh, it doesn't matter if it's telephony or uh, fiber optics or ADSL or Wi-Fi, if it's, fi if it's wired or wireless, we, we talk about this thing here. So LoRa is these three lower level, uh, physical level that we're talking about. And LoRa van is the next three level. And then of course you have your application level on top that could be like the format you send the data, like JSON or XML or a comma separate file. So, so lower vein is that higher build up and, and what it actually is and the way you can kind of like look at it is that when we talk lower between our two radios, we could talk lower vein, but we don't. We talk the own way we want to talk. And lower vein is then a, a, a protocol that refines that kind of like have the um, 
an address in a telephone number, in whatever you want to call it. So when you direct your communication via this network, then you can get the data to, to the right uh, place in other end. Um, as I also mentioned, there is a number of these other protocols, which is the normal, much more normal protocols that we have um, in, in, the, in the amateur radio. Uh, LoRa is uh, certainly not one of the, the, the normal ones here. So yes, as I mentioned, LoRa and LoRa van, um, when we look at how in this model it works. Now, <clears throat> if you want to know more about these different radios, uh, Here's the links, and, and of course this is recorded, so you can kind of like catch it from the video later on if it is. But we have these three radios. ILO 2 and 3 is the 868 and 915 megahertz. So this is kind of like the normal ISM radio. So if you're in, uh, in IT, you read in 1, uh, you can use ILO 2. You can also use ILO 1 without any other licensing. And if you're Americans, you can use ILO 3. If you want to use the ILO 1, you have to have a radio amateur license to use the ILO one. But it uses this seven centimeter band, which is the normal one that you normally will use for downlink. If you want to program towards this radio, we have a library here. Um, so you can see there's a link to that library. And then we also have the implementation of lower band, both for Arduino and for Raspberry Pi. So there's the two links there if you actually want to implement a uh, lower band on the radio, uh, which allow you to kind of like, if, if you have good lower band connectivity where you stay, then you can actually send data down over somebody else's ground station and not necessarily. Okay, I just want to quickly talk about AMSAT. So Mike talked about AMSAT. So AMSAT is like the amateur radio um, um, uh, society for satellites. So this is what typically being used by uh, universities and and, um, and uh, high schools and students that send up satellites. So they they via AMSAT get uh, um, get a license to use the radio amateur uh, frequencies. And there's a number of rules for that. So I'm not going through that. I'm not a radio amateur myself. Um, so I've I, I never used this thing here. As I said, you know, when, when we used any kind of technology, we used either LoRa or, as Mike also talked about, uh, Global Star region is also a possibility where you don't really concentrate on on, the, on anything else and just have the right modem. And it's kind of like the same as the GSM for your phone. You just connect to somebody's L satellite and uh, you will eventually get the data over the internet. So on the US, uh, on the, sorry, on the amateur radio band, there's a lot, lot of different radio bands. And you can see this is, from 2012, but they're probably they haven't changed a lot because these radio amateur bands haven't changed for many many years. And the ones that you have to uh, consider is the two meter band that is the 144 megahertz, and we don't have any radio for that. But that's typical what, the frequency you will use when you send data up to your satellite. So that's called the uplink. And then the downlink will typically be the seven centimeter, which have a sender frequency around four, uh, like start at 420 here. So you can see here that our radio is 433, so that falls in between 420 and 450, and of course you can regulate it up and down to to, um, uh, to listen to that. So that's the two frequencies normally used in AMSAT of all the different radio frequencies. There's also other use, I'm not kind of like limited to that, but I'm saying this is the normal ones. Uh, you can start, and this is always something I think is, is a, kind of like an interesting, idea is that you can start with um, with listening to um, to satellites first. And um, I have, uh, um, you know, these different kind of like um, um, uh, uh, RTL, um, so this is software defined radio. Here's uh, one of these software defined radios. And you can also get like, um, <coughs> here's, uh, Here's the one that you can see on the screen. Let me turn it around. So, so this is like a USB. It have a normal uh, antenna connector, uh, SMA connector on the other end. So I took the antenna from, from one of our radios and, and I just uh, plowed it in here. So with that, you can download a software-defined radio. So there's free software. 
and you can then um, go in and start um, a listening to satellites. And with that, I just want to show there is an open source global network of satellite ground stations. So you can actually connect this RTL SDR, for example, to a Raspberry Pi, and you have your radio, and then you can be ground station for a lot of oil. And you can also listen to other ground stations. So you don't even have to have any of this to start. So this network set not here is, is a network of ground stations all around the world. And, and it's just interesting to start looking at. So you can see these are all the different ground stations that is in operation in different places. So the green ones is those that's running, and the yellow ones, and the orange ones are those who's maybe not running right now. Uh, and you can go in and look at observations from different satellites. So NOAA is a, is a weather satellite from NOAA, and you can typically uh, download a weather, a a weather um, a radar images from that. But you can go in and look at, at these different, and you can see here it's 140,000 observations. And it's, it's just interesting to kind of like go in and get a feeling for what is, how, how these satellites work. So if you look at, for example, uh, stuff that's not NOAA, so like this one here, you can see it have a download at 435 uh, megahertz. Here's another one at 437 megahertz. And so we go with a lot of these different um, satellites. But you can go in and become a ground station similar to to these ground stations here. So, so as a project for, for school, you can go in and say, I want to be a st station. And you can then, you know, tell what services you offer, like can you uh, listen to UHF or VHF, and typically you're only listening, you're not sending data. So, so you can do this thing here with a software-defined radio. You don't have to have a license because you're just listening. But by connecting this way here, then you can actually get the other people will use your ground station to downlink data from their satellite. And you're part of this uh, greater community here. So this way you can go in and, and look at it. And you can see here, if you look at it, what there's a one in Vienna, they have an antenna that like this. Uh, they talk about um, you know the success rate and you can go in and say, I wanna use this in here. What is the future passes? And then it will calculate when a satellite flies over uh, and you will you will have the data here once it's calculating there. But, but go in and look at this thing here and then you can see how <coughs> it's maybe not a perfect uh, flyover, but you will have a good idea. Sometimes it's, it's great and sometimes it's not that great. Um, and then I think uh, the, the last thing here I just want to show you this uh, satellite that actually flying with Laura. So here's set LLA1 that flies in October with uh, using uh, um, lower downlink seven centimeters. So that's what our ILA1 runs on. And that is, um, uh, that's been launched from the ISS via NANORAC. So that's for IL University. And then there's two uh, satellites here that are also using LOA uh, as a downlink here. They've been launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base. And that's two ANSAT uh, radios here. Uh, and that's it for me. I know I'm like four minutes over time, but uh, I'm very happy to answer um, various questions if there should be any. Judy, back to you. Bjarke, great. Thank you very much. Uh, that's absolutely terrific. And um, uh, what we have is we've, uh, we've actually been collecting uh, some topics for, for further talks as well. Um, and uh, great, we've got a um, mic. Uh, I, I see here that you've you've made um, you've made a remark, a, a comment here, um, which of course you know to me not being a, a radio person looks like gobbledygook. So um, uh, I was just wondering if you if you wanted to come here, uh, come in at the end uh, to round off this discussion on on radio. Mike. Sure, Judy. I, my comment was just we were just looking at some uh, frequency ranges uh, and mentioning some in the UHF range. My comment was that the IARU, if you're going the amateur route, typically will coordinate 435 to 438 megahertz for a downlink. They're looking for it to be in that range. 
if that's useful to consider. And there are many other things to do too, but uh, just an observation. What an overwhelming amount of information you have, Bjarke. I was, uh, I was amazed by the amount of research you've done. Uh, it's looking really Thank good. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Mike, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us today. It's been most valuable and we will we'll certainly catch up to, to plan an, another session with you. Um, Bianca, to you as well. Thank you very much. And to, to William for, for coming in and, and assisting with, um, with a number of the questions. So what I'd like to do is that I'd like to close it off for this evening. Um, we have been recording the session. I'm going to send out a link uh, to the video um, once, we've, um, once we've rendered that. And uh, um, I'm also going to be sending out an invitation in the next probably 24 hours to Thursday's workshop, which is going to be on um, electrical power subsystems um, and how you can start working on uh, calculating the, the budget um, your power budgets and, and, and how you're going to, to solve your power requirements on your CubeSat. Um, so until Thursday, I'd like to wish you all well, and we'll see you then. Cheers. <laughs>